So in our world that so desperately needs hope, I don't know about you, but for me, there's not much that offers the reminder of hope like baptism does every time we watch this happen before us. What a, what a moment. And so for those of you in this room, I just want to say I'm so glad you're here to enter this celebration. For those in the fireside, those in our East venue, those watching online, we're so incredibly grateful that you're here. And I want to take the next few minutes. And I want to explain as best that I can what we just saw in baptism. Because here's what I know. When I was baptized, I, I was like six or seven years old. And the truth is, there's no way at six or seven you can really understand all that, that happened there. And I think I've spent really the, the last 36 years trying to understand what happened at that moment and trying to unpack that. And, um, you know, I, I remember vividly being baptized and I didn't understand it all, but I, I loved Jesus and I wanted to follow him no matter what. And I knew that Jesus was baptized himself and I wanted to be like Jesus. And I knew Jesus said, after you follow me, you should be baptized. And I wanted to do what Jesus said to do. It wasn't a whole lot more complicated than that. And then I remember I was, it was, uh, it was almost 20 years ago or so, 20 years ago, um, starting out in ministry and the pastor that I was working with, like on a Wednesday said, Hey, by the way, this weekend we're doing baptisms and you're going to be baptizing people. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, how do you do the whole mechanics of that? Hold your nose and all of that. So I said to my buddy, Brian, he was a little bit younger than me. So he would do what I said, meet me in the baptistry and I'm going to practice on you. He's probably the most baptized person in North Carolina to this day, like over and over over and over and over and over again. I'm like, we're going to get this right. And I don't know if you've ever seen, but like there's some funny things that happen in, in baptism. Earlier today, one of the girl's legs just came up out of the water. She was baptized so hard. Have you ever seen like a kid do a cannonball into the baptistry and they're like whoosh, jumping in or um, when I, I grew up in the South in um, a Baptist church and they, you would have like the baptistry built into the back of the worship center and the um, choir would be in front of them. So any, like you thought this was a splash zone, like you had waves coming over. And I, I think it was my wife. It was either her or one of her sisters after they were baptized, because it was like a glass you could see through, you could see them swim out. <laughs> like, there they go, like a fish. Baptism is so full of joy and it's so full of meaning, but I want us to try to understand what is it really about. And if you've been following Jesus for many, many years, or if you're new to this whole church thing and you're just here as a friend or a family member, I want to try to help us understand what did we just see? See, baptism is a sign. It's a symbol. It's representing a deeper reality of something that's going on. In some ways, it's like this ring on my finger. The, the truth is there's not that much special about this ring. If you like it, you could go to Zales and get one just like it probably. It's not the ring that's the thing that's so important. Nor was it the moment I stood up on a stage and simply said, with this ring I thee wed, and my wife said the same thing. It wasn't just about the ring. It was about a deeper commitment, actually a covenant that my wife and I made before God in sickness and in health for richer or for poor, but I mean, honestly, mostly poorer, uh, till death do us part. And, and this ring doesn't mean that I'm married because anybody can get a ring and anybody can put the ring on the finger, but it's the covenant behind the ring that makes all the difference. So baptism is a sign. It's a symbol. It's important for sure. But it's what's behind it. It's what's underneath. It's what it represents that brings out the beauty and the great importance of what it is. And so part of the reason we do baptism is, like I said earlier, because Jesus himself was baptized. Part of the reason we do it is because he said, as you follow me, you believe and then you're baptized. And part of the reason we believe is because in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus gives a commission before he leaves uh, earth to go to heaven. He leaves a commission for his church and he says, on this earth, I want you to be about these kind of things. And it's a pretty important statement Jesus makes where he says this. It's, a, it's the great commission. He says, all authority, listen to this, this is good. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Is that good news to you? Like if you're political at all, that should be really good news. If you're ever bothered watching Fox or CNN or whatever your choice, if you're ever bothered, that should be good news. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. He is still holding it all together. No matter what happens. 
I can tell you're going to be a little bit slow today. That's okay. I'll be gracious to you. So he says, in light of that, all authority has been given to me. He says this, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. This is all ethnicities, all people, all colors, all races, all different socioeconomic brackets, all tribes of people. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then he ends with a promise, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says, you can trust me in this. You can take this to the bank. I'm with you always. He begins it with all authority is mine. He ends it with I'll never leave you. But then to the church, he gives a commission as you're going into all the world. And that means going to school, going to work, going to Fontana or Upland, or it means going to the ends of the earth, to India and Africa. As you are going, here's what you to do. Make disciples and baptize them and teach them to obey everything. So part of what we're doing today is we're obeying this commission Jesus has given us as a church. And he says, go and baptize. And the word literally baptize, it literally means to dip or immerse underwater. But get this, it also means to die. It also means to perish. So we'll get there in just a minute. That word actually makes a lot of sense in what we're doing. Not in the waters of baptism, but you know what I mean. Romans chapter 6 is where I want you to turn. If you want to, if you have a Bible or if you have a smartphone or a tablet, you can follow along. Romans chapter 6 is this letter that the Apostle Paul is writing to people that are a part of a church that have seen baptism happen before their, their eyes. And Paul is saying, I want you to understand what's going on. I want you to, to really understand the depths and the reality of what is happening in this moment. So he writes them to help them figure that out. Romans chapter 6, I'll start reading in verse 1. The apostle Paul writes this. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. So how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? He's saying there's, there's something deeper going on in baptism. We're not just baptized into water. We're baptized into Jesus. We're baptized into his death just the same way that this ring, it's, it's nothing special in and of this ring. There's nothing special in and of that water. That is Rancho Cucamonga drinking water. And 60 people have been through it, so I wouldn't even drink it anymore. It's not the water that's special. It's what it symbolizes. We're baptized into Not ritual, not religion. We're baptized into relationship. There's something deeper that is going on here. And Paul wants us to understand that. And in order to understand that, I just need to take a moment and set up something that will be so helpful when we read the rest of these verses. It's a little bit of a grammar lesson, which is really scary because I do not know grammar. I'm from the South. (laughs) We don't specialize in grammar. Here's what's funny. Um, When I went to seminary, I ended up having to take Greek classes because the New Testament is written mostly in Greek. When I got to my Greek class, I had to learn English grammar because I didn't know it very well. Thank you, public schools in North Carolina 20-some years ago. I had to learn my grammar, but in in Greek, what we're going to see today, there is a prefix that's attached to a number of words that makes all the difference in understanding what baptism is. Um, In English, we have a similar prefix, uh, co, like C-O, on the front of a word. So no longer are you just a worker, but if you are a co-worker, what does that mean? Yeah, more than one. It means you're with, you're in it together, you're an associate, you're a co-worker. If you are a co-author of a book, you're not just an author like you did it on your own. You're a co-author. You are with someone together in the process of authoring the book. If you are a co-pilot, it means they're not just one of you flying the plane. You're doing this together. So understanding that, because in the Greek, there's a prefix. It's S-U-N or sometimes translated S-Y-N, soon or sin, that's put on the front of a word to say with. And baptism is all about this, being with, being together with Jesus. And I hope this helps our understanding of what baptism is about. Look at verse 3 one more time. Paul says, Or do you not know 
That all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Don't you know? You, you've got to know this. Now look at verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified. What's the word? With. With him. Don't you know that our old self, for our old self, was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So we believe scripturally Jesus died on a cross for us in our place. When we enter the waters of baptism, we are identifying with the death of Jesus. We're identifying with the death of Jesus and saying, just as Jesus died, I'm dying to a part of me. What part of me? Paul says, my old self, my old ways. What, what are my old ways? What is my old self? It's that rebellious part of me that wants to be in control and wants my way. What's that old self? It's the insubordinate part of me that says, nobody tells me what to do, not even you, God. It's the self-serving, self-centered part of me that says, life is about me getting my way. It's the blind part of me that spiritually can't even see or comprehend unless God enlightens me. It's, the, as we studied in Ephesians months ago, the dead spiritual part of me that we're not just bad, Scripture says. We're not just bad. We're dead apart from Jesus, but we're made alive in Jesus. And this old way dies when we're crucified with Christ. To be crucified with is this idea of being together, be, being associated, being in relationship, unified. Why? Here's the words. We crucify the old self so that we can be set free. Set free. That we are only truly free when we find ourselves in Christ. And with the new identity that we have in Christ sets us free from sin because we're forgiven. Sets us free from anger. Sets us free from fear. Listen, it doesn't mean we'll be perfect. It doesn't mean we'll have it all together. But it means we've experienced a new kind of freedom. Freedom from a, a addiction. Freedom from the judgment of sin. Freedom from the mourning that some of us are in right now. Because once again, the angels didn't make the playoffs. <laughs> and you can be set free and you can join the blue crew. And actually be a winner for once. <laughs> Why are we clapping more for the Dodgers than for Jesus? Just kidding. Set, but he's come to set us free. Jo, uh, John writes the words of Jesus, If the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. So if you have been set free by Jesus, would you just say these simple words? I've been set free. Say it with me. I've been set free. Is anybody thankful for that? That's good news. And so when we say, I want to be identified with the death of Jesus, it means there's old things, old ways, old habits, old pride, old self-centeredness, old rebellion that we want to be in the past because when Jesus comes, Paul says, old things are gone and all things are new. He changes things. And there's a new hope and a, and a new joy. Listen, it doesn't mean he makes everything easy. He doesn't say that, does he? Doesn't say he makes a pain-free life finally like, whoo, now everything's comfortable. But he says in the middle of the heartbreak of life, there can be hope. In the middle of the confusion of, of what's going on in our lives, there can be a peace that passes understanding. It comes through a new identity in Jesus, and baptism represents that. We're identified with Jesus in that. Here's how the Apostle Paul said it in a very famous way. He said, I am crucified with Christ. I've been crucified, what's the word? With, with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the greatest news you could ever hear, that God loves you so much. He loves you radically. He loves you so much. He gave his son Jesus up for you. Jesus died so that you and I can have real life. Here's the paradox. Here's the paradox we find in baptism. 
that the person who has died is actually the person who is free. The one who has found their ultimate identity in Jesus and the old ways are dead is the only one who's truly free. Like you and I can only be all that God has created us to be when we die to the old so that we can live to the new. So we identify with the death of Jesus so that we can be free. Jesus said it this way at one time. Whoever wants to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That does not mean easy. You're taking up your cross. You're denying yourself, dying to wishes and desires. You're uh, taking up your cross. You're following a way of sacrifice and surrender. But you get to follow Jesus. That makes all the difference. So then, first of all, we identify with the death of Jesus. Second, we unite with Jesus' burial. Verse 4 says this in Romans 6. We were therefore buried, what's the word? With. With him through baptism into death. We, we were buried with him in baptism. This, this with him, this buried with is a horticultural word that talks about a seed being planted in the ground or a, a branch being grafted. Grafted. It's two things that don't necessarily go together. Being grafted together, we were buried with him in this way. Look at verse 5. And he says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. If we've been united in that way that only God can do in bringing two things that are opposites together, us and God, and God can bring us together in Jesus as only God can do, we can be united. Again, this word, united with, means to be planted together, to grow together, to sprout or produce, to spring up. Two things that don't necessarily fit together being brought together. And maybe it used to be in an in a old day that that didn't make sense. This in our new reality should make a lot of sense. Two things that don't go together can be brought together in our day and age. Have you ever heard of a pluot? A plum and an apricot being put together. What in the world is that and who came up with that? And what part's the plum and what part is the apricot? I mean, like, I just don't even know. In my house, we have this modeled for us every day, two things that don't go together being put together, golden retrievers and poodles. Who would have ever thought, put them together and you get a golden doodle. Now, that's when we first brought them home, at the, the little one, and they didn't go together at all. Um, and you can't tell what part's golden retriever, what part's poodle, because guess what? It's all, it's just who they are. They're together, united. Paul says, what's modeled for us through baptism is God bringing us together with Jesus. Two things that don't really belong together, but God in a mysterious way unites us together. It's this union, listen to this, this is so beautiful. It's this union Union with Christ that gives us wisdom. You ever need wisdom? I don't mean like smarts. I I don't mean like intellect. I don't mean like you need to pass a test so God give me wisdom. I mean like wisdom, understanding to know how to make sense of life, to know where to go and what to do. It's this union that gives us peace. Christ, for those of us who are in Christ, is our peace. Ever been in a situation that you're like, I don't know how to make it through this. I I feel like my world is falling apart. And yet at the same time, I have a peace that passes understanding. It's union with Christ. It's this union with Christ that we find hope. Hope as an anchor for our souls when life is up and down and things are out of control. That there's a a, a rooting, a, a grounding, this union in Christ. It's this union with Christ. Listen, this is interesting. This union with Christ that then unites us with others. That Jesus said, the world will know you're my disciples by your love for each other. It's this union with Christ that... that unites us together. So therefore, if we're united with Christ, we're united with others, which means there is never any place for bigotry, prejudice, racism, judgmentalism, because we've been united to Christ and to each other. Things have changed. Things have changed. And so Jesus says, there's one person who's really believing that one. (laughs) Jesus says, our identification makes all the difference in, 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 
in understanding the death of Jesus and how that means for us to die to our own ways so that we could really live. How, how the united in the burial could let us know this profound truth. If we have met Jesus like this, the promise of Scripture is this. God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. There are times with all of us where we feel alone we feel abandoned. We feel forgotten. We're, we're, we're like, I'm overlooked. Is anybody paying any attention? And, and the promise is if we've been united with Christ, in your loneliest moments, God is there. Amen? In the moments that you feel forgotten and overlooked, God is there and he is with you. You have been united with him. But it's not just about death and burial. It's not just about identifying with Jesus' death it's not just about uniting with him in burial. It's that we can live a new life. When we put the people being baptized under water, we're identifying his death, his burial, but then we bring them back. Aren't you glad we bring them back up out of the water? We bring them back up out of the water to say, just as Jesus rose to a new life, we are rising up to a new life. Look at verse 4 again. We were therefore buried with him, through baptism, into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live, get this, a new life. A new life. Uh, the life that is abundant that Jesus promised we could have. Jesus hasn't come to take away life, to take away fun, to limit your life. He's come to give you a life that is overflowing with hope and joy and peace. In Romans 8, Paul says it this way, that if the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. There's an if there. If the Spirit is living in you. Then He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. If you have been united with Jesus like this, if you have this new resurrected life, the same power, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave is at work in you, is at work in me. And we can take God at his word that we are resurrection people. Like we say that at Easter. When at Easter we think about the resurrection and we think about what kind of life does this mean for me? But even on October 1st, months away from Easter, we are resurrection people. We've been called to a new hope, a new life that we can find only in Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 8 of Romans 6. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. If we died with Christ, if we died with him, Paul says we believe we will also live with him. A resurrected kind of life. A different kind of life. This word live with this word, this prefix with, it means a, a life that's fresh, a, a life that's strong, a life that's full of vigor. It means a, a life that's not easily defeated. It, it means a life that doesn't easily give up hope because there's a renewing hope. A, a life that even has peace in the midst of the hard times. A resurrected new kind of life. Here's the paradox. When we give up trying to build a life for ourselves, we can find life in Christ. Nothing compares to. Again, in another place, Paul reminds us, probably my favorite verse in all of Scripture, God is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine according to his power at work in us. See, you and I have dreams of the, the life that we want, the life that we hope we can achieve. And God has got other dreams. And he wants us to experience life. Now, God's life plan isn't always the easiest, most comfortable. Things don't always work out to our favor, but it's the kind of life where he's with us all along the way. It's the kind of life that matters for the sake of others all along the way. And here's the idea. It's sort of like baptism, but it's sort of like 
maybe my, my, my ring illustrates this better. It was almost some 17 years ago that we were getting ready to get married. And, and we were like in the hectic, like, you, like everybody else, you're trying to figure out flowers. You're trying to figure out music. You're trying to figure out food. You're trying to figure out what your costume's going to be for your wedding. Because it's sort of what it is, right? You put it on once and you take it off. And we're trying to figure all of that out. And it was stressful planning a wedding. And then it dawned on us, we've got to prepare for a marriage together. The wedding's the easiest part of the whole thing. It's the marriage that's hard. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Just want to make sure we're in this together. And what baptism portrays isn't just something that happened way back when and we sit back and we're like, well, I've done that. If you've done that, and if you meant that, and if you were identified with the death of Jesus, united with him in his burial, then you will live a new life with him. Here's all I want to say. Anybody can pray a prayer way back when. The question is, did you mean it? Anybody can get in the waters of baptism. The question is, what difference did it make? See, we can do outward activity and our hearts not really mean it and not really be connected to God and never have this. So I want to ask you, like, really? Has there been a moment where you surrendered your life to God? Like you were going that way and you turned, you died to that. See, here's, here's what scholars will tell us is going on here in Romans 6. I'll get theological for just a moment, but I'll make it as simple as I can. Two things. On one level, scholars, uh, theologians call it justification. It's a one-time kind of an act before God where we're made right, where we repent, we believe, we turn to Jesus. And on that, that place, we now have a relationship with God. We're justified. There's a second part of this that scholars say is sanctification. It's an ongoing trying to die to my selfish desires, die to the struggles of life, and live for Christ. And that will never be completed until I die here on this earth. And so I'm always going to be working in that area. But the question for us today, has there ever been a moment, ever been a moment where we truly repented and said, I'm so sorry, God. God, I desperately need your help. And we turn from our ways to Jesus. That moment is the moment where we believe by faith and we're united with Christ. It's not simply about praying a prayer. And it's not simply about I can mark a day that I got wet in this thing full of water. It's, was there ever a transformation that really took place? And how will I know that? Well, what Paul says is, you'll know it by a life that's different. A new kind of hope, a new kind of peace, a new kind of joy. You won't know it because you're perfect. Nobody's perfect. You won't know it because everything's going well. That just You don't have any control of that. You will know it by an abiding faith and confidence and hope in God no matter what happens. So have you ever had that moment? Have you ever had that moment? Ever had that moment where you just encountered the grace of God and you said, I don't deserve this. And guess what? That's why it's grace. None of us deserve it. None of us can earn it. It's about us getting the end of ourselves. That's why we die to ourselves, because we can't save ourselves. But we say, God, you've come to rescue us. You've loved us. You've given your son for us. And now we turn. We want to be identified with your death, Jesus. We want to be united through your burial, Jesus. We want to live a new kind of life through your resurrection power. Does anybody need that today? So I just want you to hear me say this. We did not plan to do this. But this is going to be the third time this morning we've done this. If you're here today and, and, and you would just say, I know that whole, that whole piece, I've never done that. 
I know there's, there's just not been a real moment where I've repented, I've turned, I've believed, and I've experienced a transformation, but I long for that today. I just want to talk to you for just a minute. The Bible says today could be your day of salvation. Today's the day that you could receive this unbelievable gift. God's love, God's grace for you. And there's no magical formula or no magical thing that you say for this to happen. But in just a moment, I'm going to just pray a simple prayer. And if you're here and you're like, that's, that's what I need to say today. That's what's going on in my heart today. I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer. To be bold and call out to God and say, I'm sorry. I need you. So could we just pray for just a moment? I'm going to ask everyone in this room, everyone in the fireside room, everyone in East Venue, would you just close your eyes for just a moment? I'm going to pray this simple prayer, and if this prayer resonates, echoes with where you're at in life, would you pray it there as you you sit? Just say, dear Jesus, I need you. I know that I've sinned. Please forgive me. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave. Today, I believe. And I want to follow you as my Lord and Savior. Eyes closed in this room. I'm going to ask you wherever you are under the sound of my voice with eyes closed I just want us to have a moment of prayer is there anybody in here who would just be honest and say Aaron I just want you to know will you pray for me I just prayed that for the first time ever would you just lift your hand up you would say Aaron I prayed that for the first time and I mean it I mean it I mean it anybody else God bless you anybody else And put your hands down. I want you to all look at me for just a minute. One of the things that I love about days like today is, is baptism is this moment where, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody's got it all figured out. But boys and girls, women and men all weekend long are being bold and courageous and taking a stand for Jesus and saying, I'm not ashamed and I want others to know. They've led the way. So now I want to ask, We've, we've just started doing this around here because it just helps us know we're in it together. If you just prayed for the first time that prayer, and if you just raised your hand and you said, I, I do, I believe, I'm turning to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do one more bold step because I think it matters so much in letting you know you are a part of a new family. Would you just be bold? Would you be courageous? We're going to get silent right now. And would you just stand and declare, I believe. God bless you. God bless you. Stay standing for just a moment. Hey, hey, real quick, hold your applause. Hold your applause. God bless you. I want to be able to hear everyone who does that. God bless you. Anybody else, you would just say, today's the day. I believe. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Anyone else? We didn't plan to do this at all today. This is, this is one of those God calls. Was it for you? Anybody else? Can we just let every single one of these know how, how thankful we are? And then for those of us who have been following Jesus, we know that we are following him. But the cares of life, worry and fear has robbed us of this resurrection life, this new hope, new identity, new peace. Could we just pray now and say, God, remind us of everything you are and all that you do. Remind us of your grace now. Would you just pray with me? We just want to say thank you, God. We need you. We long for you. We were created to find our identity and our life in you. So would you today remind us, whether we're new to this story 
or whether we've heard it many times, remind us of this good, good news of your love and your rescue and your son you sent for us and the new identity we have with you through Jesus. It's such good news. And we pray that we would leave this place today transformed. Leave this place today filled with a new hope. Leave this place today encouraged by you, Holy Spirit. Leave this place reminded of the resurrection life you've called us to, a life full of purpose and a life full of meaning. And you're not done with us. You want to do in our lives and through our lives amazing things. And we want to follow you. So it's in your name, Jesus, we pray all these things. And together, let's all say amen, amen. amen.